We're talking again with Andy Schmuckler. Andy is, um, among other things, he's, he's uh, run, preparing himself for a run for the Democratic nomination for the 6th District Congressional seat in 2012. And we've had Andy on recently to talk about uh, issues of the day. And Andy, uh, w thanks for joining us. And want to talk about, first off, you know, going down a list of, of topics that we can address uh, in, in contemporary American uh, and current affairs. Uh, the, 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 I guess that we can term them, you've termed them the three showdowns. Uh, December on the tax cut uh, expiration, April the government shutdown that was so much discussed, and, and the coming one on the debt ceiling. Um, how does that relate? You know, you, you talk a lot about the elephant in the room, that concept. Uh, how, how does that all relate? How does that all tie in together? Well, you know, the, my, uh, that elephant in the room idea is about the, the uh, uh, I think we have a serious national crisis about what one of our major parties has become and about what the other major party is shrinking from the, its responsibility to do something about it and, and maybe not even perceiving it. But what the, what's happened is that we've got a, a, a Republican party that is... Uh, that it, it, it uses its power in a more destructive way than anything we've ever seen from a, a major American par party. And uh, the only way that a force like what this Republican Party has become in recent times, and by recent times I mean at least this decade, the only way it can have power is through deception. And, and specifically only by deceiving uh, a substantial part of the American people about what it really is. Uh, nobody would, uh, the, the number of people who are benefiting from how they are conducting themselves is very, very small. But the number of people who are, who give their allegiance to it is quite substantial. They are a major party and, and in the last election they did, you know, they did just fine. Uh, but the, those people, uh, if they knew how that power that they're entrusting their political leaders to was being used and how it's following out the, uh, the, the, the country that they love and taking power away from them and taking wealth away from them and making them and their children's lives less secure, they would never, never give that power uh, away. So they need, they need to deceive in order to do it. And the, re the conclusion from that is that the way that we can protect ourselves against uh, this power is if we can find a way to undeceive the people who have been deceived. If, if, and I think, I think most of the American people don't realize that uh, the uh, abuse of power from the Republicans is, is, is so un extraordinary. I mean, we, we see things on a daily basis which if they'd happened in the, in the 70s or 80s or, or 60s or 50s, I mean, people would just have been appalled, but they'd become normal, and I'm not sure how many people realize how extraordinary some of these things are. And one of the extraordinary things is that the, that the Republican Party and these showdowns that you were mentioning uh, last December with the with the uh, question of the expiration or extension of the Bush tax cuts. Uh, then this uh, spring, uh, I guess March, April, uh, about whether the government would be uh, shut down because of a lack of a budget deal. And now with the, uh, the, the even more dangerous uh, situation of uh, allowing the uh, debt ceiling not to be raised, what they basically, the Republicans have basically done in each case is to say, they make demands and they say, if these demands aren't met, we will do, we will hurt the country. It would have been bad for the country back in December to allow all the Bush tax cuts to be, uh, to, uh, be, uh, to expire. It would have been bad just because we're in this very deep uh, recession and a tax cut would have been a blow to our very fragile recovery. So it was a case of, if you don't give us what we want, we will uh, hurt the country. Now what they wanted was to allow, uh, well, the, everybody agreed that the uh, middle class tax cuts should be extended. But the question is, should, there, should it be only on the first quarter of a million dollars that every family uh, 
uh, earns, or should it be even on the last dollar that a, that a billionaire earns? And the Republicans insisted that it should be uh, the latter, that, uh, that they, w they would block the uh, extension of the first quarter million uh, of income if they weren't allowed to also give the billionaires a uh, tax cut on their last dollar earned. So uh, that, that's blackmail. It isn't a part of the American political tradition for a political party to uh, say, meet my demands or I'll hurt the country. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying, Chris, about that kind of blackmail? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so that was the, uh, in addition, what the Republicans were demanding was in itself a bad thing for the country because it was, uh, it was a way of, uh, it, it, the, the, the Republicans have, uh, you know, pr pretended to care about the deficit, but it added, uh, for their, their demand would add uh, $700 billion to our national debt over the course of a 10-year period. And it was the word, if you're going to spend money that would, to, uh, uh, that would add to the deficit, it was the worst way in terms of stimulating the economy. There are other things we could have done with that money that would have given five or six times the boost to the economy as giving money to the richest people in the country. I mean, that, this, is just, this isn't just me asserting things. I mean, economists study these things. And the problem is, you know, you give a billionaire an, an extra $100,000, he's not going to spend most of it, because he doesn't need to spend most of it. But if you give it to uh, these people who are uh, unemployed, they need the money, so they spend it, so the economy gets stimulated, and it's called the multiplier effect. So anyway, that's the setup of the, of the, the showdown, and um, that shows you something about the nature of the Republican Party, that they behave in ways that are contrary to our political traditions and our political ideals. Well, the other part of the problem with the elephant in the room is that the Democrats avoid confrontation. They simply do not call the, 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 the Republicans out to expose publicly uh, their atrocious behavior. And so, uh, without having made an issue of it <laughs> to, in the ways that would have gotten the American people's attention, the Democrats, and particularly President Obama, caved in, and we got all those tax cuts, uh, including to the billionaires, extended. And if, if it wouldn't have been, it would have been bad for the country if the Democrats had called, I mean, in a short run sense, it would have created some degree of havoc, but it also would have called attention to the American people to exactly what the Republicans were doing. First of all, the polls show that the American people didn't agree with raising the, uh, with, with, with extending the tax cuts for the rich. So it was a, it was a winner. But the Democrats avoided the fight. And it, it, let me make the contrast with what happened in Wisconsin when the Republican governor, newly elected, again with deception and hypocrisy and, uh, and, and, and doing things which uh, take money uh, away uh, from uh, average people in order to give it to, to serve their corporate masters, tried to strip away the collective bargaining rights uh, for uh, public workers in Wisconsin. You know what happened there. What happened was that the people stood up, the Democrats in office stood up, and, 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 and threw a, made the situation into a crisis such that we had time as a nation to look at what was going on. And Wisconsin had time as a, an electorate of, of that state to look at what was going on. And he, the, the numbers in the polls shifted markedly. They saw what was happening. Because, because the crisis was created, people got a chance to see what that governor that they had just elected was doing, and they thought it was ugly, which it was. And that changed the public opinion, and I think that there's going to be, uh, you know, with these recall elections, that, that that shift in public opinion is going to have real political effects that are good for Wisconsin because what the Republicans are up to is not good for the nation as a whole, for Wisconsin as a whole, for the American people as a whole. That's what happens when you allow a, a, a crisis to develop. But the Democrats capitulate rather than have a confrontation, and this is what they've been doing uh, 
pretty much, you know, since uh, since the misdeeds and crimes uh, of the Bush administration first surfaced, the Democrats have uh, avoided confrontation. And then, uh, so Obama says, well, you know, it's, it's tempting not to say you're not going to negotiate with hostage takers, but in this case, the hostage hostages would have uh, were the American people, and they would have been harmed. Well, that's true. But there's a reason why people don't negotiate with hostage takers. If you do it, if, if you give in to their demands, that teaches the hostage takers that blackmail works. And so we came a few months later to the next showdown, which is, is the government going to be shut down, which is not good for the American people. We found that out back in the 90s. People don't like it. There are good reasons not to like it. But the Republicans, again, were saying, if you don't give us what we want, we're going to hurt the country. Again, a very un-American way of, uh, uh, of behaving in our democracy. But again, the Democrats avoided the, the shutdown by agreeing to the Republicans' demands. And again, the Republicans' demands were really not good for the country. According to the Congressional Budget Office, they're going to, it's going to, uh, it means it's going to cost the American economy, which is in which the greatest problem we have is unemployment. It's going to it's going to eliminate another 400,000 jobs because of the of the destructive kinds of cuts that the Republicans were insisting on. Uh, which, by the way, the cuts themselves were at the expense of the uh, of average Americans and of the most vulnerable Americans. And uh, uh, so. That sets the stage for the next showdown, where we really can't afford, according to some people whose knowledge I, I feel compelled to respect, we really can't afford to uh, call the Republicans bluff, because it could be a really, really serious, uh, uh, but we could have allowed the, the tax cuts to expire and dealt with that situation. We could have allowed the government to shut down if the Republicans had made good their threats. Uh, but this is, a, this is the elephant in the room problem. We got one party that behaves badly, and we've got another party that is failing in its responsibility to expose publicly so the American people get at what they're up to. So where do we go from here? You know, we've, we've known this, the, the two Americas, so to speak, uh, have, been, have been well uh, documented, I guess, the, the different directions we can go for, for, for some time. Um, you know, we, we've, we've seen elections go back and forth and back and forth over the past maybe 30 years uh, from, you know, the pendulum has been swinging awfully aggressively. Where, where do things go from here? What do you think? Well, uh, I don't, again, I think that what's going on now is unprecedented. I mean, we, I don't know what it is you're, you're, I couldn't quite follow what you're saying. It's been going on for 30 or 40 years, but. Uh, well, we've had, we've had, we had, uh, you know, baby back to Reagan. We had, uh, we've gone from Republican presidents to Democratic presidents, back to Republican, back to Democrat. We've seen Congress just in the last three cycles. Uh, the 2006 uh -huh. election goes overwhelmingly Democratic. 08 election goes well for, for Democrats. Obviously, 10, we, we, we reverse track uh, back. Uh, you know, the American electorate doesn't seem to be able to come around, coalesce around a direction. And, and that's, you know, that's... Well, well, in, 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 a, in a normal American political situation, the, um, the vacillation between parties is probably a good thing. We need a good conservative party in this country uh, to make sure that the, the good liberal principles don't get out of hand in, in, in that direction. We need a good liberal party in America to make sure that the good conservative principles don't get out of hand in that direction. But what we've got now is an unprincipled party. I mean, there are people who say country first, but then when the other party uh, wins that election in 2008, when, even though we're in a time of several national crises, they say uh, that their first priority is to make the, the, the president fail, because that's the way to get power back for them, even though the failure of the president it means damage to the country. We only have one president at a time, so the, the, the unprincipled nature of the party is shown by the running in 2008 under a banner of country first and turning around just a couple months later to say, we're going to try to make the president fail. I don't know any opposition party in American history that has been so uh, 
willing to sacrifice the nation to try to get power back for itself. So, so the unprincipled nature of this party tells, shows you that it's not conservative. Conservatism, in every form that I've ever learned about, is very much about principle. And, and this party, uh, because they didn't want this, this president to have a record of accomplishment, would filibuster and try to defeat even ideas that they had once advocated, sometimes even only weeks before they had advocated it, but they didn't want the president to have a record of achievement. So the public interest and principle are of no relevance to explaining the behavior of this Republican Party. So it's good to have, uh, you don't want to have a one-party government. You, 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 a one-party system always gets corrupt. It's good that you have a, a lively democracy where where the, each party gets a chance to correct the mistakes of the other. But we're, we're in a situation now where we've got a, a political party that is running roughshod over American ideals, is damaging the American polity and American society. Society, uh, on everything that it touches. And I'm not a person who exaggerates. I have, I have been considered a very, uh, you know, sort of uh, moderate and thoughtful guy. I'm 65 years old, and I was considered by the, the, the audience around Harrisonburg where I was on the radio wishy-washy because I would see two sides of every issue. I'm not the kind of guy who, uh, who just is interested in seeking partisan advantage. I was considered by that radio audience to be uh, um, sort of a, I wrote a book whose subtitle was How to Bridge the Divide. So if I'm talking like this, I should have some credibility. This is an extraordinary moment in American history, and our basic values and ideals under, are as great a, under as great a threat right now as at any time in our history, and it's because one party has become so destructive, and the other party is afraid to stand and fight. So how, how does that get rectified? And you mentioned the example of Wisconsin and, and Democrats there uh, you know, taking a different approach instead of being more conciliatory. They, they stood up and fought. So, uh, is there a lesson yeah. there to be learned uh, you know, state by state on the national level uh, by Democrats uh, who do seem to be, to be much more willing to acquiesce, uh, whereas Republicans, you know, w you know, whatever, whatever their motives might be, uh, and of course the motive of any party is to get people elected, but their motive, they, they seem to stick to their game plan a lot better than Democrats do, I guess we could say. Well, in terms of what we can do, um, I've asked myself that question, and, and I'm doing the thing that I thought uh, was in my power to do, and I invite everybody who sees what I see uh, in the country uh, to take on the same thing. The, the, the secret to taking the power away, the, 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 the shaft that leads to the power core of this Death Star is to speak the truth, uh, to expose publicly what the Republicans are up to. And, that, and there are all kinds of ways that people can do that. You can do it, well, you can, you can help out my campaign, but that's really not, you know, that's not my, uh, the emphasis this isn't about me, this is about the need to, to, to uh, have a learning process. Uh, you can write letters to the editors. You can speak to your uh, conservative neighbor in some gentle way and say, this is, isn't there something wrong with threatening to, to I'll hurt the country if you don't give me my demands? Is, is that the American way? And just sort of let that sit there. Or you can, uh, you can recruit other people who also see it to take on the job of finding every opportunity to uh, speak out about the, the elephant in the room and to, to use the, the social networking technologies of our time to make some of these messages go viral. And I'm going to try to be doing that in my campaign. And then there's finding the particular issues that people really resonate with. In Wisconsin, the issue of uh, collective bargaining rights for p public workers went very deep into the Wisconsin uh, set of values. They had a history there with that. In Virginia, here, we, we don't have that history. We don't have that right for people. But there are other issues that are on there. For example, in the Ryan plan that they, the Republicans in the House just voted, not quite unanimously, but just about, to pass, the, uh, the Republican budget that came out of the House is really a disgrace. It, 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 it pretends other to be reforming Medicare, but it's really destroying it. I'm not, creating, I'm not making this up. I mean, beginning in 10 years, they will begin to shift 
the burden of the health care of older Americans onto those older Americans. And we, you know, there's a reason. And, and, and so as time passes, what is the Brian Pan plan where it put into effect in this country? As time passes, more and more older people would be just a health crisis away from either death or bankruptcy. The, the burden, if they had a serious problem, the, their, their, their health, uh, health insurance coverage would not, as it is now with Medicare, would not cover their expenses. They would have to, they would have, to have the money, and if it was an expensive thing they had to deal with, they would not be able to do it. We would have people dying, just as we, our health care system right now has 45,000 people a year, a Harvard Medical School uh, study showed. 45,000 Americans a year die for a lack of health because I mean, for a lack of health insurance. Well, anyway, people are getting the picture with respect to Medicare, and I think people all over the, the Shenandoah and Roanoke valleys that uh, uh, the make up the district in which I'm running, and I suppose make up the uh, the bulk of the audience that, to which uh, you speak. Uh, care about Medicare. Eighty percent of the American people don't want Medicare messed with, and the Ryan Plan does that. And and for what purpose? I mean, if you really look at the Ryan Plan, I've read several very responsible people who analyze it. They take the money away from Medicare and from the medical uh, giving older Americans a degree of security about their health care, and they take it and they make for a. a, a a, a still further tax cut for the richest Americans, taking the rates down to where they haven't been in living memory. I, think, I mean, all, I guess some people are old, old enough to go back to 1931. But you know, what kind of party is it when we have the greatest gap between the very richest and the rest of the Americans as we've had since the 1920s? We're getting hollowed out, looking more and more like a, a banana republic in terms of the distribution of wealth. What kind of party is it that takes money away from the health care for our older people in order to enrich the richest? It is really, it is atrocious. It is an atrocity. It is un-American, and, and everybody who can see that the basic values of our society are under the most serious threat are being eroded at a rate I never thought I'd ever see in my country. I invite people to take on the idea that if our grandparents or our parents, depending on your age, had to sacrifice to protect us from fascism coming from abroad, that all of us should be willing to sacrifice some of our ease and take on the job of talking about the elephant in the room, exposing publicly what this Republican Party has become. We're running low on time, so Andy, we'll leave it at that. We'll, we have more conversations, listeners, uh, scheduled with Andy as the next few weeks and few months roll on. But for now, Andy, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Chris. I uh, appreciate the chance to get this message out. I, cu I could not feel more passionately about it. I'm running in spite of the fact that that's not the life I want to live because I've drafted myself into, into an army, and I'm trying to issue the call to battle to have other people join me.